Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our lifelong learning panel discussion uh, focused on the future of work and the transformative power of sustainability. Uh, for this series, we're exploring how leaders and companies can leverage industry changes, technological advances, and organizational strategies to accelerate innovation, create value, and shape the future of work. Uh, my name is Jason Parrish, and, I'm, and I help to manage alumni engagement initiatives at Scheller College, including this series. Before we kick things off and introduce the panel, I just wanted to remind everyone that your cameras and mics will remain turned off for the duration of this event. Uh, please, please feel free to ask questions, however, by typing them into the event chat. We'll also be sending out a few audience polls during the event, uh, so be sure to keep an eye out for those as well as we go along. Uh, with that said, I'd like to start by introducing today's moderator, Steve Murchison. Steve completed his MBA at Scheller College of Business in April 2019. During his two years at Georgia Tech, he served as a graduate research assistant to Veryl Takte, the faculty director for the Ray C. Anderson Center for Sustainable Business. In this role, he contributed many of the center's projects, including providing guidance and feedback to the teams participating in the Garvin, Carbon Reduction Challenge. Upon graduating, he also served as a judge for the 2020 edition of the competition. Steve most recently held a category manager role at Georgia Pacific, where he managed a portfolio of cutlery products and had ownership over the category sustainability strategy. Unfortunately, our second moderator, Beryl Takte, is unable to join us today due to a family emergency. Uh, but thanks again for joining us. And uh, with that, I'll pass it to you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Jason, and thanks for inviting me to, uh, to participate in this. It's probably too small to see, but I actually dug out my MBA ambassador uh, shirt for this. I haven't worn that in a couple of years. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, hope you've all managed to stay safe and healthy during this pandemic. Um, this is a kind of our new normal, holding these things via web chat. So um, thanks for joining. Um, hopefully things go smoothly. I'd like to start by just sort of introducing, introducing the Carbon Reduction Challenge uh, before we start asking questions of our panelists. So the Carbon Reduction Challenge is a summer long competition where students work with organizations that they hold internships at to design projects that reduce carbon dioxide emissions while saving money. They then, are have, they then have the opportunity to pitch those projects to relevant managers and decision makers at their organizations and some of the projects are actually adopted by the organizations. What's special about this program is that the carbon reduction project is a self-directed project that students take on in addition to their regularly assigned internship duties. Another fun fact, it's actually a collaboration between the Scheller College of Business and the College of Science, and was co-founded by Dr. Beryl Takte from Scheller and Dr. Kim Cobb from the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And it wouldn't be nearly as successful without their vision, passion, and guidance. So we actually have two first place student mentor teams with us today. Um, the SunTrust team, uh, which is now Truist, represented by Will and Amy. Uh, they were the inaugural winner of the CRC in 2017. And then the Chick-fil-A team, uh, represented by Casey and Stephanie. Uh, and they were the first prize winner the following year. So I'd like to take a minute to let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, let's start with Will and Casey, and then we'll have Amy and Stephanie introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining today. My name is William courage Claire, and I am currently the end-to-end -end business solution manager for EMEA, currently at Coca-Cola. Uh, before that, I was in the technology risk group at SunTrust, uh, where I participated in the Carbon Reduction Challenge as an intern in 2017, and then as a program mentor uh, for other interns in uh, 2019. Casey? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Casey. I graduated uh, from Georgia Tech this May with a degree in environmental engineering. Um, I currently work as a field engineer for Mortensen Construction building solar farms. And in 2018, I interned with Chick-fil-A sustainability department uh, with Stephanie, and we uh, participated in the carbon reduction challenge. Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, Amy, you're on mute. Of course I am. Um, hi, I'm Amy, technologically challenged apparently. Um, happy to be here with y'all today. 
Uh, I have about 13 years of social impact work um, under my belt so far. Uh, the last four of those years I've been leading ESG programs for financial institutions in the Fortune 500. Um, and I'm currently looking for my next opportunity. So uh, currently unemployed um, and excited about uh, what's on the horizon. I led the CRC for SunTrust in 2017 and helped establish the mentoring program that Will actually ran later in 2019. Awesome. Stephanie, your turn. Hi, everybody. I am in the sustainability department at Chick-fil-A, and my focus is primarily on energy and water consumption and reduction at the restaurant level. I also keep one eye on new technology that's coming to market that will also support those efforts. Probably the most significant thing to know about me on a personal level was on Earth Day of 2010, I pledged to reduce my carbon footprint by giving up my car. And I figured out how to do that in this past April, Earth Day, I have completed 10 years and on to my 11th year of reducing my carbon footprint. Congratulations. That's it. Atlanta is not an easy place to be without a car. I should know. I, I did it for several years myself. Um, thankfully, I live centrally and it wasn't too bad. Um, so let's get into the projects a little bit. Um, could, could you guys all each tell us um, one about your projects, uh, sort of how you came up with the ideas um, and how you worked as a how the student and uh, and mentor relationship, how you work together to to drive a solution and, and hopefully implement it. So, um, Will and Amy, do you guys want to go first? Walk us through your project and talk about how the work how the work uh, proceeded. Sure, um, I'll start out and then William Will can take over. Um, uh, when the team came on, what really made our team really interesting is that we had six students that were uh, interning throughout the bank, and each of their managers donated two hours of their time each week to spend with me on the carbon reduction challenge. So I didn't actually have any interns or an intern. They were actually other people's interns. Um, but I chose three projects that the group got to choose, um, select one project whenever they came in. They chose the hardest one, which was transportation, employee transportation for business. Um, and we decided to run it more like a consulting team than anything else. So I kind of let them um, make all the decisions on how to move forward. They asked me questions, and, and when they did, I, I really pushed back and uh, encouraged them to research and do um, more kind of legwork, which I think worked well. Um, Will, I'll let you just grab kind of the project and, you know, whatever else. Sure, exactly. Thank you, Amy. Um, so one of the big lessons for us in the carbon reduction challenge that played into how we actually picked one of those three projects is that uh, we were looking for the smallest adjustment with the biggest impact. So some of these projects were a little bit more broad, like one of them was a, a walk, bike, and take the train to work challenge, as we've kind of been discussing here, uh, that requires uh, a lot of employee behavioral change and just a little bit um, of carbon reduction across the entire system. Whereas we chose to uh, focus on reducing domestic staff air travel and also to use greener rent-a-cars. So for example, we changed from intermediate uh, to economy class as the company default. Uh, and this, I believe, had a carbon uh, impact of about 1.85 million tons uh, over five years and about $2.1 million in savings over the same period of time. Awesome. So before we before we move on to the Chick Play team, Amy, I just have one follow up question that I think might be interesting. You mentioned you had three three projects that they picked from, and Will, you kind of discussed your guys' rationale for choosing the one that you did. But Amy, I'm just curious how you prioritize those three projects over over other potential options. So it was really based on what I felt like was accomplishable for the team um, to come in. I think we could have chosen some really um, hard-hitting projects, but I wanted them to be able to really sink their teeth in, but also achieve the goal at the end of the day. And so I think the other one will, and I may be wrong, but I think it was waste. Um, it was something focused on waste. And then um, the more fun option that they definitely immediately said no to um, was the employee transit to work. 
Um, and then they, they dug in and chose the hardest one. And the data that this team mined, I cannot even tell y'all how many lines of Excel <laughs> they had to manipulate to come up with this um, with the solutions for this project. So awesome. Stephanie, Casey, you can, kind of want to walk us through your project a little bit? Sure. Uh, Casey came on board with us in 2018. And just earlier that year, the company had decided to really take a more integrated approach to sustainability through a reorganization. So we were very fortunate to have him and his resources and this particular challenge to support some of the efforts that we were doing. So as you know, we are a real estate company that sells chicken sandwiches, right? So a lot of uh, where our carbon is has to do on our construction side and our building side of it. So we worked on, uh, I'll let Casey dive deeper into the projects, but we selected a couple of projects out of that side of the business that would help us inform and make some decisions moving forward. And then uh, we worked on a, another one through the travel department that also impacted um, some of the selections that our, our business travelers uh, utilized as well. And we thank SunTrust for us being able to um, utilize that as well. But um, it was a great project and Casey really dug in deeply and gave us a lot of great data out of that that we still utilize today in our conversations and narrative and decision making. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, just to dive into the projects a little bit. Um, so the first was a retrofit of our parking lot lights. Uh, they were metal, metal halide bulbs and we were able to approve a pilot for, uh, I believe it was 12 restaurants to retrofit those parking lot lights with LEDs um, and uh, then go from there, seeing how they perform, uh, hopefully rolling out to more stores. And then another, uh, one of our projects was installing dishwashers in the back of the house, uh, rather than having employees wash dishes by hand. So that was actually something that came to, um, I guess it's the employee experience team, um, where, you know, employees uh, having to wash dishes, it's a time consuming task. Um, and, and there was other reasons for, for that project to move forward, but we made the case for sustainability there um, and, and got that rolling uh, across, I think it was 500 restaurants by the end of the summer. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, we also took a page from SunTrust's book um, and analyzed uh, how our employees were, were renting cars when they traveled. Uh, there are some dedicated travelers for Chick-fil-A who, who have to be in a rented car uh, quite a lot of the time. So uh, the change we ended up making was a little, it had to be a little different uh, than SunTrust, but we definitely uh, used their idea for inspiration. So that's probably something we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but uh, I, I know those Excel sheets and luckily our, um, our <laughs> uh, Chick-fil-A is rather, um, rental car company had some of it summarized for us already. So I, I don't think I had to do quite as much mining, but uh, yeah, that, that was inspired uh, by the SunTrust team. So I, I'd like to hear from uh, each team individually um, or, or each person individually, if you guys all have something to contribute, but was there sort of a big moment during the project where that was particularly enlightening, kind of an aha moment for you that maybe changed the way you were approaching the project or thinking about sustainability or, or collaboration or anything like that. Uh, Will, do you want to start, Will and Amy? Sure. Uh, I think one of the big takeaways uh, from the carbon reduction challenge is that in order to do sustainability work, it kind of hinges on this new flat management network organization style of business. And it is critical that you have the skills to network across different organizations and also to be able to uh, perceive and deal with conflicting priorities uh, throughout the way. There's a lot of people to convince. Um, you also need to make sure that you mobilize everybody in those departments behind your initiatives. And on top of that, have a sponsor for your project at the top who has decision-making rights uh, on behalf of everybody else. Yeah, just to play on what Will was saying, I think for for our team in general, I don't want to speak for Will or the rest of the team, but for me, I, I think the huge moment was when we were able to schedule a meeting with several members of our C-suite, um, several executive officers, 
um, and some of their senior staff to come in and really hear about the work that Will and the team did because sustainability was brand new at SunTrust at this point in time. Um, I had only been there for a year. Um, and, so, and I was the first sustainability person that they'd ever hired. So um, to be able to have this opportunity to get this team in front of multiple C-suite representatives um, and there, these C, you know, we had the CHRO, we had the CIO, and we had the CFO, and we have multiple team members of theirs who were who were actual contributors to the project. So it really showed how um, sustainability is about breaking down the traditional silos that a lot of our organizations work in. And I know that's horrible, like corporate speak that nobody wants to hear, but that really is, that was the aha moment for a lot of our senior leaders, I think, seeing how all of this has to work together to accomplish a common goal. Casey and Stephanie, was there a moment for you guys? Yeah, I'll, um, I well, have I two probably... really, go ahead, Stephanie, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so our first, like I mentioned, was um, realizing that we could piggyback off of previous carbon reduction challenge teams. Um, and, you know, when it comes to sustainability and carbon, progress is progress. And uh, nobody has a patent on turning off the lights when you leave the room. Uh, but that, you know, cost and carbon savings goes straight to the bottom line. So sometimes it's low-hanging fruit that, um, you know, people aren't thinking about. And um, sometimes it's very simple solutions. And then kind of going along with that, and Will's already mentioned this, is uh, when you start getting into the, the math of, of how, you know, carbon and cost savings work, but mostly carbon, it's, it's uh, oftentimes a lot better to, I think Dr. Cobb is fond of saying this, find a, a large uh, knob, volume knob, and turn it like a half degree to the right versus trying to turn a bunch of little switches. So, you know, you could have, one perfect restaurant, one perfect Chick-fil-A restaurant that's, you know, carbon positive or negative or whatever and creates more energy than it uses. Or you can make a small change across 2,600 restaurants and, and watch the uh, cost and carbon stack up. Stephanie? You know, for, for us, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were just getting underway with a holistic approach to sustainability. So having this data to be able to share it with other departments was very impactful. If sustainability's job is done right, and if the, the carbon work, work is done right, then there is an economic impact. And I think that was a big eye-opener for a lot of people in our organization. And then I think on the other side of the table, what I would like students and um, folks coming out of uh, college to, to realize is that even though the data is there and the significant returns on investments are there, doesn't always mean that you move forward. Building that internal support and that case for support is extremely important. And then you have to realize the company has competing priorities. And when you have a, you know, a finite amount of budget, things that are going to help with the growth strategy, growth strategy of the organization tend to take priority, at least, you know, that's how things can play out in our world. So again, that data, having that information, that ROI and the economics of sustainability was significant for us. And that was a, a, a kind of, a, I think, an aha moment that I've learned in working with students as we go forward. Um, and then also having that financial story be able to weave into the narrative across our departments was very important as well. Yeah, and, and you know, a number of you mentioned, you know, financial impact, bottom line, ROI, and just to kind of put some of this into perspective for the people that, that are on the call in terms of how large of an impact these student-led projects can have, the Sun Trust project um, that, that Will and Amy worked on, um, would the as re, as planned would reduce carbon emissions by 370,000 pounds of carbon dioxide annually and save $258,000 per year and the, the Chick-fil-A project you know as proposed once fully rolled out uh, could potentially save up to 1.6 million pounds of CO2 emissions and three and a half million dollars per year so 
you know, that we're not talking about insignificant amounts of money in carbon and it just goes to show that when, you know, someone takes the initiative to, to have these conversations and put in the time and build the business case for these projects, you know, the savings and the benefits are actually substantial. So there's quite a bit of urgency today to address climate change through a combination of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. You know, we're proud of these, these carbon reduction challenge projects um, and imagine the impact as they scale within the organizations and potentially across others as well. And we think about the future of work and we recognize that tackling these big challenges like climate change requires collaborating in new ways and almost creating a bottom up movement where there's all hands on deck to find creative business solutions. So Casey and Will, um, what did you two learn from this experience about collaborating cross-functionally and, and leading and influencing horizontally across an organization? Uh, Will, you kind of talked on it a little bit already, so let's start with you and if you have anything further to add. I don't think there's much for me to add, Steve, in all candor. Honestly, um, because sustainability is such a systems issue, it once again in, uh, involves multiple parties to be on board. And when you're doing a transformation effort like this in a business um, where there's no set department, there's no set hierarchy for it, you kind of have to go around and get grassroots sponsorship that legitimizes your ask up to the top. All right, Casey, did any takeaways from your experience on collaboration and, and leading and influencing? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I owe a lot of credit to Stephanie uh, for getting our collective feet in the door of various departments and just letting us sit down with people and start talking to them. Um, because, you know, people are busy and, and they have their own jobs to worry about. Uh, but one thing I noticed was that when you have, especially with the carbon reduction challenges, is a very unique uh, platform because it's a self-directed project by some bright-eyed intern. Um, if you get them in the room with, with the right person, a lot of times there's uh, some reciprocal enthusiasm. So with self-directed work, um, with work that um, you know is somewhat off the clock, so to speak, it's just someone's project that they're enthusiastic about having happen. Uh, I found that I, I was very, very pleasantly surprised with the amount of um, support I got from other members of Chick-fil-A staff, whatever department they'd be in. Um, I remember a lot of times going in and just mentioning, oh, well, you know, it's a competition. It's kind of like a science fair. And a, a lot of times, as soon as I mentioned that, they'd be like, oh, well, we're going to win the competition. What do we need to do to help you out? So sometimes, uh, you know, that's, that's something that's a little bit unique to the carbon reduction challenge. But um, when it comes to just having someone who's, who's, uh, made this a serious priority. Um, they're willing to jump across the silos and go and find people. I remember even we were trying to, one of the projects we were gonna do that didn't go through was um, looking at the corporate fleet of vehicles. And I remember I couldn't get the data from this person or that person. So I just went to the parking lot and started writing down model numbers because I, I just wanted to get it done. I wanted to get the data. So sometimes, uh, with with that kind of work, that's that's a benefit. Is you can kind of uh, flatten whatever hierarchies uh, exist. So now that you guys have both graduated and have started your careers, um, were there any takeaways from the carbon reduction challenge that you've been able to kind of put put to use um, in your day to day work? I think for me, the carbon reduction challenge, having done it twice now, was honestly a perfect plug and play into the job that I'm doing. So currently for Coca-Cola, I'm in charge of deploying digital platforms across uh, Europe, Ital Middle East, and Africa. So as far east as Pakistan, all the way over to the UK, or Ireland, I should say rather, and all the way down to South Africa. And the Carbon Reduction Challenge teaches you how to make high impact on a really tight schedule. So I think having been through this exercise, I am able to mobilize uh, solutions a lot more quickly than some of my peers. Um, as haughty as that sounds, it is really good training for that. Um, and furthermore, uh, in any kind of transformation effort, the Carbon Reduction Challenge has taught me that uh, when the impact is big, 
it's okay if we just turn the switch just a little bit instead of activating multiple switches, as Casey said, um, because the point is to get people started. The point is to get people uh, going along the journey with you and we can convince and we can work out the details and we can work out the ideal situation uh, as we go along. Casey, anything from your experience that's you've been able to leverage in your day to day? Absolutely. Um, yeah, this is. I mean, I, I've told um, Chersey and everyone at the Race Action Center. If you give me twenty minutes with anybody, I can convince them to do the carbon reduction challenge. <laughs> um, so I've, <laughs> I've absolutely uh, learned a lot from that uh, in my job right now. So I in construction and uh, carbon reduction challenge helped me with listening to experts because you know you have to gather a bunch of information and, and some of it is stuff you've never seen before um similarly in my job right now there's someone who knows what needs to be done or, or what the protocol is you just have to find that person and a lot of times it's some guy out in the field who he didn't graduate high school but if you put him in front of a combiner box he can wire it with his with his eyes closed so you know sometimes it's just a matter of listening to people who know what they're talking about um, and and uh, gathering um, data from all the sources you can. So um, we did a lot of that with the carbon reduction challenge. I remember there was another consultant working with the uh, dishwasher team and they happened to have data that we could really use. So we just, you know, trusted their work and worked with them and, um, you know, it's, sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right person who, who's maybe even started on what you're trying to do and, and uh, just helping them and being supportive rather than trying to lead an effort. So I know Beryl's always looking for more CRC sponsors, Casey, so I'm actually going to give you the last 20 minutes of this to uh, pitch it. <laughs> more on the call, if that's okay. I'll do it. I've already um, done it. I've already done it. I can do it. And if um, anyone wants to work on a solar farm, anybody watching who's an alumnus or just wants to do a carbon reduction challenge for a solar farm, uh, let me know. I'm um, actively well, recruited. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about your team because it was it was a team of, of six individuals, um, six students that were working with Amy and yourself on the project. How, how did you guys uh, assemble that team? Um, and do you think there's anything unique about its composition that um, contributed to your success? Right. Um, so not a great story in how we came up with the team. Uh, essentially, um, a bunch of us SunTrust interns were emailed uh, by the Racy Anderson Center for Sustainable Business uh, saying we have this cool carbon reduction challenge thing. Uh, reply yes if you want to join. <laughs> Uh, and frankly, there were six of us who said yes. Um, I think two of us were uh, industrial engineering. Uh, I was business T and M, uh, and um, the other another business, um, actually another industrial engineer. Sorry, so three of them: two business and one computer science. And um, we were uh, dispersed across two different intern programs at the bank. So most of us were in the technology sector, and a couple in wholesale banking. Uh, what was special about the team is that, um, one, we had a lot of manpower. So we had about three different uh, subsets of our project being um, domestic uh, staff air travel, uh, the other being rent-a-cars, and a third prong being taking uh, more efficient airliners. So we were able to divide two, two, and two uh, to accomplish work a lot more quickly. And with Amy's help, um, the fact that there were more of us, we could easily more connect across different departments and also take the time to be able to do it. Um, so while I'm sure Casey will tell you um, all the benefits of being a single person team, uh, there are kind of some benefits to having a larger team in which you can cast a wider uh, network and a wider net. Good. Um, Casey, you were also a technology uh, minor uh, to go along with your civil and environmental engineering major. Um, how do you think that a combination of those two things help you prepare for the CRC, but then also your career after you graduated? 
Yeah, so TNM is a great program. I, I actually didn't know Will you were in it too. Yes, uh, class of seventeen. Seventeen, okay. I think I was nineteen. So, um, yeah. Anyways, so I, Will can tell you just as well as I can. It's a great program. Um, you give me another twenty minutes with the same person, I'll convince him to do TNM also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just hearing church to laugh in the back. That's up. what uh, yeah, exactly. TNM helps you to do. Exactly. So um, it's a great program. Um, preparing for the carbon reduction challenge. I mean, it taught me how to write emails to people and not have them come across as, you know, either too long, too short, whatever. Um, that's like the first thing I can think of. But of course, um, every class in that program, you're working with people with different backgrounds than you, um, different expertise again. So it's, it's a similar point that, that I made earlier is that um, sometimes you got to sit back and let other people drive on a certain task of a project because they're the expert. Um, and that's something, TNM, for, for both those projects in that class is it takes a bunch of kids who have, you know, whatever crazy GPAs and high flyers and they want to do this and that and want to take extra classes and it puts them all in a room together and then puts them on project teams together. So all these kids are used to being, you know, the highest achieving person in the room and then you put them in a team together and you have to recognize when to step back and not be the leader of the group or when to, you know, just take your task and just do your task correctly. And so with my job now, that's 100 percent what I do every day is there's there's things that I can control and there's things I can't control. And I just try to if it's my scope, then I do the best I can. I, su I support however I can. But sometimes it's it's not your scope and and you just have to let the experts do what they've been doing sometimes for 20 years. So, um, yeah, TNM is a great program. Um, Helped me a lot with the Carbon Reduction Challenge, all my internships, and, and now in, in my full-time role. Great. I, I want to talk a little bit about sustainability and the future of work in general. I'll bring it back sort of to the, the theme of this conversation. Um, but also, you know, what we've sort of learned from the pandemic within the, the context and, and within the context of sustainability and the future of work. So one of the biggest challenges we've faced over the last 10 months, it feels like 10 years over the last 10 months has obviously been the pandemic. Um, it's tested the resilience of our economic system, our healthcare system, social safety nets, uh, and social cohesion. Um, and resilience is something that, you know, is being discussed in the context of sustainability and it's beginning to emerge as a, as a truly important economic imperative to get you through um, times like these, times like the pandemic. Um, so Stephanie and Amy, I want to hear from the two of you on what, you know, what you think we can learn from the Carbon Reduction Challenge on, on building a resilient organization and increasing the resiliency of our organizations. Um, Amy, do you want to, do you want to tackle that one first? Sure. I mean, I think we've heard a couple of times the theme of this, and I'm not shocked because it's a major tenet of sustainability is kind of this um, building of relationships across an organization. I think what's key there is learning what drives leaders in different areas and at different levels. And so I think the future of work, even though as this pandemic has been very has made this very well known, we're somewhat um, remote and removed from our workplaces in this, but communication and relationship building skills is going to continue to gain in importance, um, even as we become a more remote um, corporate environment. Um, but I think really it's kind of, you know, really understanding how sustainability connects to all the different areas within an organization is essential. Um, it is, that's how you really get to know the risks and potential future risks related to resiliency and business continuity um, and where potential opportunities for um, proactive response to resiliency really lie. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that key, um, that key connection of why making these relationships um, so uh, making making these good relationships is so important is because we need to figure out what those potential future risks are. I think in terms of um, the future of business continuity and resiliency work, I think you're going to see a greater focus on human capital management topics like employee health and well-being. I think mental health will also become a, a higher priority topic. 
Um, I also think um, remote work and time away from work is going to continue to be an important topic. You know, traditionally, when you look at a business continuity plan or the ones that I've come in contact with in financial services anyway, their really primary focus is IT and making sure you can service your customer. Um, and and I, I don't know that we've really ever considered the employee's role in that. And I think you'll see that kind of um, as an uptick um, when we start talking about the future of, of resiliency and, and business continuity planning. I think that's going to be supported by shareholders and off-season communications. And um, I think even, you know, on-season, I think there are going to be very specific questions around how companies have handled human capital resources or human capital management um, with respect to business continuity in the past and what they're doing to change their actions now. Um, so those are the, the three main things that kind of pop up for me. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Your your kind of take on the CRC and sustainability and resilience, and and how it can kind of position these companies to to be successful in the long term. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, there are three key aspects I I think that we think about when it, in regard to climate and impacts on business, and you know, that's resources that are available. Um, we look at the people. To Amy's point. What's the impact that it has on people? What's the impact um, on infrastructure? So one of the things I am often amused at, when we did our first materiality assessment and interviewed key stakeholders within the organization and outside of the organization, not one person mentioned energy and water as material to our business. And we are so accustomed to flipping a switch and having energy and having water and having gas and all of that come on, um, and be at our disposal, it has really been recently that we begin to look at what are the implications of not having those resources. And then on the flip side of that, how can we make sure that we're not taking more than our fair share in our business for those resources? So it's how do we, how do we protect it and how do we make sure that others have what they need in the communities where we do businesses? So, that was uh, a bit of an, an eye opener for us. Um, and and when we when we look at the resiliency, we know that if if our suppliers don't have access to resources, you know we can't build buildings, and that's our growth strategy is where we can build buildings. And if our um, supply partners don't have access to corn or wheat or lettuce, you know, then obviously if they don't have access to that, then we can't open our front doors or we have to ensure that there is depth on our bench, which has really been an interesting change recently in how we've managed aspects of our supply chain. So we have seen the impacts of uh, climate or severe weather or fires or flooding or, or and all of that uh, that has come into play. And we have made sure that those key ingredients on our menus have more than one supply partner and are located outside of uh, perhaps the same geographical region. Same thing with our, our building materials and supplies. Um, without them, you know, we don't open our doors. And it's not just because then we won't be in business. We know that we have 25, 2,600 restaurants, and each one of those restaurants employs anywhere from 75 to 225 team members. That's a big impact on that community when we have as many restaurants in those communities as we do. So, you know, it's, it's, we don't forget about those people. Uh, the people aspect of it, and we don't forget that uh, having that resource availability gives us the opportunity to play a larger role in that community more than just a great chicken sandwich. Great. I, I just want to remind everyone to, if you have questions, please submit them in, in the event chat so we can we can circle around them at the end there. We're probably going to get to questions in about 15 minutes or so, so if you have any, please please put them in the event chat. Um, Stephanie, you mentioned community a number of times there when you um, how has the pandemic impacted um, your organization's ability to kind of build community, um, both within the organization but externally with the communities in which you exist? Um, 
and, and, and how does that community building affect the resiliency of Chick-fil-A and, and your ongoing uh, operations? Um, I'll start with staff. So from the staff perspective, we've gotten pretty creative on how we continue to build community and stay connected with each other, even though we are not physically in the same room. So we have coffee with, we have small groups, we have all these different uh, creative ways to stay engaged. The company has also I think done amazing things where there have been additional funds that everyone receives if you're raising children or taking care of a parent who may be impacted by COVID. We have a, a additional allowances for time. We've been given an amazing amount of resources to provide our mental and physical and spiritual support. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very long list and it uh, makes me feel proud and um, I'm happy to tap into those resources myself. So they're appreciative there. And as for building community in our communities, um, we are aware that resiliency, if our doors aren't open, we can't provide a feeling or a sense of community in that neighborhood. And if you know Chick-fil-A, hospitality and community is critical and important to us. That's why we only have we have operators who only have one restaurant. We want them to live in that community, be a part of that community, to be sitting in those stands on Friday night when football happens, if we ever have that opportunity again. So community is really important to us. And so in the neighborhood where our, our uh, restaurants operate, when that grid goes down, if we can stay up and running and have um, our, our neighbors and our guests in that restaurant being able to plug in and be in community, that's what we're working towards now. So this has been a, uh, a big eye opener for us because right now our dining rooms are closed. We don't have that sense of community right now. So we're trying to understand what can we do in the interim, build that. But in the meantime, we're looking at what does the restaurant of the future look like? If we can be this successful without dining rooms, how do we marry that culture of people and creating community um, with what you know the business may or may not need. So we're at the table right now having that discussion and it's very uh, live right now and I don't have an answer for you uh, yet, so stay tuned. <laughs> um, Amy, we've talked about this a little bit, so I'm not sure if you'll have too, too much to add necessarily, but I just thought I'd phrase the question a little bit way. So, you know, in your opinion, what is the future role of collaboration with organizations as they are faced with challenges such as the pandemic and then, you know, secondly, you know, your role as a mentor in the CRC, did that change the way that you've looked at um, collaboration or horizontal leadership? Or alternatively, um, how has the way that you've leveraged collaboration or horizontal leadership sort of evolved throughout your career as you've, you've built a career in social impact and sustainability? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think for the first part of the question, I want to go back to something that Casey said. Um, and it's really... And my mind just went blank. Okay, Steve, repeat the first part of the question. I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. Um, so in your opinion, what is the future role of collaboration with organizations they are faced with challenges such as the pandemic? And you kind of touched on it earlier, so I don't want you to have to repeat yourself if, if, if you feel like you've already answered that question. No, no, no. Um, well, I had something really great to say. Um, so... I think that there's strength and diversity of thought, um, and I think that's a major tenet of sustainability, and I think that'll continue, it'll, that will continue. Um, in terms of how the CRC helped me with kind of growing, um, I think one thing that this team did for me was realize how valuable um, that diversity of thought can be when it's coming from all different areas of a bank or any sort of organization with different areas of expertise, right? So Will's expertise is very different than some of the other team members. And so what he brought to not only his, his area of expertise, but the strength that he brought, he has a, he's a great speaker, as you all know, um, and he's a great presenter. And then we had other uh, team members who had other strengths um, with the same actual area of expertise that Will had, right? We had a really deep diver on data analysis, and but he was not, he didn't really necessarily want to be the major presenter, whereas Will stepped forward and wanted to do that work. And so I think it's figuring out what are the strengths and weaknesses of the team that you're surrounded by? What are, what are the kind of, as I alluded to earlier, 
what are, how can you get a win for your partners in this? Not everybody is going to be excited about sustainability. Not everybody is going to be excited about, you know, business continuity planning. Um, but you have to find a way to get wins for everybody that you're working with. And that's how you're going to bring people on board. Slowly, they'll become educated. But first, you have to appeal to them in some way. Um, and I, I do think that's kind of the, the future of, of what we're going to have to do with sustainability. It's been that way from the beginning. And as Stephanie said earlier, like you can't just have. Particularly in a time when we're dealing with a pandemic. Um, and some of the social issues that we've got going on right now, there are competing business interests and you can't just depend on an R ROI. Like you've got to have you've got to have some other peaks of interest in there somewhere because. It's just not always going to win and you may have to reapproach next year with the same idea uh, with updated data <laughs> um, when when the when the business atmosphere has changed a little bit. So I think it's patience and then really figuring out. What what is the win win you can create? Great. So th this is something we haven't really touched on, but it is a Georgia Tech event, so I'm going to ask the question. Um, and, and this is an open question, so anyone feel free to ask to answer. But you know, individually, what do you all view sort of the role of technology and innovation uh, within the context, or what that role of technology and innovation is within the context of sustainability and sort of the future of work? Go ahead, Stephanie. So I'll, I'll just jump right in there. One of the resources that I have available to me is sort of uh, what we call our internal shark tank. So in the business, if I have a pain point, meaning I need some technology to help operators reduce their consumption of energy or consumption of water or keep the uh, lights on and, and have resiliency. So I go to my shark tank and I lay out my business challenge and we have the opportunity through our consultants externally on the East Coast and the West Coast to have them um, embed themselves into finding us resources to solve for that that don't exist in the market today. Sometimes a company will invest in uh, an innovative product coming to market or sometimes we will simply be the first big brand that steps into the ring to be the first customer for this um, uh, new innovation. And I love, I love having this resource because I firmly believe that nothing drives innovation like sustainability. We're always looking for a way to do it, you know, better, faster, with a bigger return. And so to have this available to me is, is I think, phenomenal and very innovative. And I would love to invite you to come and visit once our campus opens up again and see how our uh, new ventures and innovation team works because they have been able to provide me some resources that I know I would have not, not had the time to vet on my own. Great. And she means it. I visited Chick-fil-A several times during my MBA to get tours um, from Stephanie. So if you are interested, she, she means it. She'll take you for a tour. Um, anyone else have anything to add about the role of innovation and technology uh, within sustainability? This is Amy. Um, I think that what Casey alluded to earlier was learning from other organizations on what was successful and not successful for them. So when we're looking at human capital management and spe specifically as a result of this pandemic and how we can prepare for future turmoil in our society, um, I think one thing that we'll be able to do is look at different industries. Just because I've worked in the financial services industry doesn't mean that I can't go to Stephanie and say, here's an issue that I'm having. This is where I'm feeling like our employees really want some help. Is this something you've seen? Does this resonate with you? I think there's learning across sectors that can really happen um, and create even more innovative ideas. If you look at the path of sustainability, it's, it's building blocks, right? Um, and so it's how do we build upon what we've already done? I think Casey alluded to that earlier and so did Stephanie. So I think we're going to continue to see that. I just think we're going to see it in a lot of different areas as well, not just environmental sustainability, but you know, corporate sustainability. So human capital management, um, employee resources, you know, what are the loan funds that we're creating for some of our employees when they go through times like this? Um, you know, how do we how do we become more innovative so that we're supporting our people as well? I think personally. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think personally, when it comes to innovation and, and sustainability, um, I think there's a lot of uh, 
groundwork that needs to be done that's not necessarily creating something new, uh, but just getting everybody on the same page about what may already exist. And it might be new to that person or that company. Um, it, but there's, I think there's a, um, a tremendous opportunity for the flow of information to be um, more open and for more people to be on the same page about, you know, just the stuff we've been talking about here about how cost and carbon can go hand in hand, um, about how resiliency and risk management a lot of times are the same thing as sustainability, you know, making sure that business can be an ongoing concern for the next five, 10 years. That's something that a lot of people should have buy into and, and should understand. And uh, a lot of times the solution there is a, what people will call a sustainable solution. Um, so to me, it's not necessarily, I, I think 100% there are new technologies and, um, you know, creative ideas and, and use of, you know, whatever uh, new stuff is coming out that the people at Georgia Tech or wherever are developing, that they really help move the needle. And, you know, they make something possible that wasn't possible before. But I think sometimes the reason why things uh, aren't happening is not because they're not possible, but not because, but because people just aren't on the same page about what the capabilities are and, um, you know, uh, just what already exists that, that we could be doing. Um, and when it comes to learning things, it's, it's maybe introducing something that's not that new um, to, to someone who's just earlier along in, in the learning curve of, of sustainability. And as a short addendum to that, you can also leverage technology, especially IT systems nowadays, to help everyone in the organization understand those capabilities that Casey was alluding to, standardize them, standardize best practices, and also be able to share uh, the raw data across in a standard taxonomy that anybody can use at any time. Technology is really a beautiful catalyst to solve any kind of transformational systems uh, issue sustainability uh, being one of the more pervasive uh, of those. And for lack of a better term, sustainability is ingrained into everything. It's, it's almost insidious for lack of a better term. And you can use a proper technology system along with best uh, practices um, for growth, for risk management otherwise, to really accelerate that change. That's great. I, I have um I have one more question that I want to ask as a follow up before we get to questions from the audience. We've talked a lot about collaboration within an organization, across an organization. Do either of you or any of you feel like there is room for collaboration, you know, across an entire industry or even between industries um, to help advance sustainable causes in in sort of a non competitive kind of way? Yeah. And I'll open the floor to anyone who wants to go. Yeah, this is Amy, and I'm sure Stephanie, all... you probably have the same. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sure you have the same um, statement, but for financial services, we do have a subgroup of uh, ESG and sustainability experts who work in the financial services arena, and we meet once a week and talk, or once a month rather, and talk about um, all of the challenges that we encounter. We talk about new and upcoming technology. We talk about um, kind of shareholder trends, uh, what we're hearing from our shareholders. Um, what are the new reporting methodologies? What are the new, um, you know, what everybody's doing? Um, it's been extraordinarily helpful um, for me. I can email any of my friends in the financial services industry in ESG and I get, um, I get responses that are very specific to my industry. I will also say I think there's a really um, a, a wonderful linkage that can be made in corporate governance. Um, so corporate governance folks tend to know each other very well through some of their professional organizations. Um, and so you can start to ask some of those ESG questions through corporate governance organizations as well um, that are cross sector, not just specifically to whatever industry you're in. Um, but yeah, the, there's a couple of examples that I've seen. Stephanie? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say it is, uh, you know, I think imperative to build those relationships and have those conversations. And I enjoy talking with my counterpart at McDonald's and at um, Starbucks and so forth. And, you know, we always say we're not exchanging recipes. We're talking about 
you know, raising the tide so that all boats join us, right? So uh, I find that to be extremely helpful. In a recent conversation I had with Kroger, he provided, you know, a, 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 some insight onto how to create, how to, how to use our data that Casey had developed for us and, and in a different way that would build that case for support. And it has really made a difference in um, people looking at what we're doing and the way that we're doing it and the outcomes that we're, that we're having. So it's great to have those internal relationships and having those external relationships that are maybe not necessarily in my industry, but you know, there are that box retailer, which is basically what we are. And uh, I, I don't think I would be as effective in my job if I didn't have those resources and relationships. And conversely, I am honored when I get called upon to um, ask advice or an introduction into another part of our organization that can help um, understand some new technology that might be out there. A uh, recent example was, you know, what we were going through in COVID, all of us were looking at you know, how do we turn over uh, indoor air quality at a rate that's going to provide safety for the um, uh, team members in our restaurants or, you know, someone else's in their uh, business as well. So we all came together to sort of figure out what are the ASHRAE requirements? What are we going to do in going forward? How are you using this technology? What is this? And it was talk about coming together in a crisis and, for, and, and lowering those barriers to whose business does what and just all in it together to figure this out to keep our environments, our work environments healthy and our business healthy and figuring out ways to get people back to work. So it, it, it this crisis has been quite a challenge, but it has also yielded some wonderful gifts and opportunities that may have not come along had we not gone through this. Did I answer your question? Yes, <laughs> I'm not definitely. sure. Yeah. Um, so I think at this point, we kind of want to open it up to the audience for questions and comments. We've gotten a couple so far. Um, if you have a question you want uh, answered, please go ahead and paste it in the event chat. And if we have time, we'll, we'll try and get through them all. Um, you know, the, first, the first one that we got, Stephanie, is, is directed towards you and talked a little bit earlier about supply chain. Um, so does Chick-fil-A, do you choose vendors in your supply chain? Um, that have similar sustainability goals, um, and if so, do you do you audit those vendors to kind of ensure on alignment? Great question, and very topical and very relevant right now. We have not typically in the past chosen our vendors based on their um, sustainability efforts or their alignment with ours. However, Recently, that is shifting, and we are in the midst right now of evaluating how we are going to evaluate our vendors in that regard. And as we look at measuring our baseline on a greenhouse gas and what that's the implications that each one of our vendors will have, that's going to become even more and more important. We're moving slowly through that process, but it is um, getting legs, as we say right now. Thank you. Um, this next question uh, is in response to a point you made earlier, Amy. Um, based on your experiences, but feel free to for anyone to answer it. Um, based on your experiences um, and the increased focus on equity issues, what opportunities do you see in general or looking back on the CRC projects to more explicitly connect environmental and social sustainability um, and invest in the, the S of ESG? Um, so you've, you've seen some organizations um, out there doing some um, heavy investing um, in um, communities of color, loan opportunities for people of color. Um, I think that's great. I wish there were, I, I wish there was a little bit more focus on actual community development work, meaning are you really getting into the community and really understanding their needs and listening to the needs of the community? Um, I think there is and has been, and I won't go down my rabbit hole of energy burden <laughs> or climate justice, um, but um, there's been a very long history and connection with low income communities and um, just the fact that, you know, they, they, they're just generally placed in, whether it's been intentionally in the past and hopefully not anymore, um, 
but they've just they're located geographically in in areas that um, are not as healthy as affluent communities and um, so my hope is that while I've seen an increase in funding for communities low-income communities communities of color um, and it's creating a lot of opportunity my hope is that there's a little bit more groundwork moving forward um, where we're actually talking to the communities hearing what the communities have to say hearing what their needs are um, and responding with um, to those needs rather than what the community can what what the organization can do does that make sense so mm -hmm. instead of saying well um, you know and not to throw banks under them <laughs> but this is my experience um, but we're a bank so why don't we create a loan for XYZ well I think we should talk to the community and find out what they really need do they need local food do they need do they need fresh fruit do they need fresh vegetables if that's what they need then let's find a partner and create that opportunity for the community rather than just throwing the loan fund out there um, so anyway that that's my hope um, internally you know I think there's some uh, there's some opportunity for um, pay equity analysis uh, of corporations uh, I think that's gonna have to be um, I think that's gonna be demanded frankly in the future from shareholders um, so those are the two things that I um, you know, from an external community building and then internally, com internal community building, the two things that I think are going to be most essential in the future. Great. Um, so before before we wrap up, I want to I want to each of you guys one last question and like an answer from from all of you because I think you all have something to contribute. But to, to anyone that's on the call um, that might be interested in getting involved in sustainability at their own company or in their own, own organization, uh, what would be your recommendation um, to get involved in, in sustainability? Uh, Casey, let's go with Casey. And yeah, uh, my recommendation is to do something concrete. doesn't really matter what it is. Um, you can create if you don't have recycling bins put some recycling bins out um, if you don't have you know it just an initiative to turn off the lights when you leave the room whatever it is doesn't matter how simple it is because and maybe it might even be better to start with a simple idea because as you go through you're going to realize that there are logistical challenges to putting this thing together no matter how simple the idea is really and um, that's the beauty of the carbon reduction challenge is if for, you have to do something you have to get something done by the end of the summer and that's what I would do if I was in an organization I wanted to get started. Uh, figure out something to do. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as it you know, is directionally correct, even if it's very simple and small. And through the process of putting together that initiative, you're going to find other like-minded people who are willing to go the extra mile to make sure there's a recycling bin next to the trash can or make sure that the light is off when someone walks out of the room, that kind of thing. Um, so starting small is... 100% okay because there will be momentum uh, uh, as a result of that and there will be a network um, as a result of that. And that, that would be my suggestion is um, whatever, it could just be a pet peeve of yours that there's no recycling bin next to the garbage can. And if it bothers you a little bit, I guarantee you it bothers other people a little bit too. So um, really just find something small and start on it and um, if there's a sustainability team in your organization, bring it up to them. I'm sure they'll be happy to support you. They'll be very excited to learn that someone else in the HR department or whatever cares about the, the trash cans. I 100% guarantee you that that will be the case. So um, that's my suggestion. Start small, do something concrete, and get some momentum going. Exactly. And just to tack on to that, I mean, there's a correlation between uh, excess and then cost and then consumption of CO or emission of CO2 rather. So the kind of uh, really easy solutions that Casey is talking about, uh, you can do that today. Um, maybe that means you turn off the lights when you leave the room, as he said. Maybe that means that you bring your own cup of coffee um, instead of going down a uh, two or three times a day to uh, whatever coffee shop you have in your office. Uh, that's a big impact right there. And then furthermore, if there actually is a little money to throw around um, to get some carbon savings or some cost savings back, if you look at the projects that have won the carbon reduction challenge, ours included, at their core, none of them are really that difficult or they're not really the most uh, sexy or intricate projects. 
what we did at SunTrust is we said, um, if you're going to rent a car, use a Ford Fiesta instead of a Ford Focus and make that the default. Uh, and really ask yourself, do I need to travel? Or as we've all learned the hard way, can we do a video conference like this? Um, and some of the most successful projects are, as Casey mentioned, they're involved turning off lights, or if you have some money to throw around once again, uh, buying better light bulbs or buying better dishwashers, uh, things like that. It's very simple to get started. Uh, the point is that you must get started and whatever solutions come afterwards, you can figure them out when the, that comes and you can really transform your company into a green powerhouse once you are ready. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, I would, uh, my suggestion is this, ask yourself, what do you want to be known for? And what do you want your business to be known for? And there's so many wonderful frameworks out there right now that can help guide and shape it, whereas, whether it's the CDP or the GRI, um, and there's the sustainable development goals that's easy to pick. Um, I know it seems a little intimidating, 17 goals, and underneath each goal is quite a few other initiatives. But pick one that you're passionate about and that you want to make a difference in and that you want to, you know, to Casey's point, make a change, move the needle, pick that. And then the other one that I know we're working on here in Georgia is uh, Drawdown Georgia, based on Paul Hawkins' work on uh, Project Drawdown. And what I like about that is every single thing that's mentioned in Drawdown Georgia and Project Drawdown already exists. So we don't have to go out and find new technology or new ways of doing or, or invent a different thing to do. It already outlines one, uh, lays out 100 things that we can do to get to 1.5. So take a look at Drawdown Georgia, Project Drawdown, and take a look at the sustainable, sustainable development goals. Figure out what you want to be known for and take action. Move the needle. Amy? Your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, this has already been said, but um, just reiterate, reaching out to the sustainability person or people or team um, and really try to make a, a connection with them. Um, I would have ideas like like Stephanie said of what you want to work on. Um, but I think it's important to go to go to the sustainability team and really collaborate with them because you don't want to start an initiative that um, is not supported by uh, that team. So just to point that out. Great. Well, I want to I want to thank you guys all for for, for joining today. Um, creating a sustainable future is is all of our jobs. Um, I'm really proud of both of your teams and, and and all the others that have participated in the carbon reduction challenge. Um, you know, it's it's been a demonstration that good ideas can come from anywhere in our cross functional collaboration and self directed work holds a lot of promise for the future. Um, you know, we're grateful to Amy. Amy, Stephanie, and all the other CRC mentors um, for their commitment to action, uh, learning projects that have been so instructive for, for students at Georgia Tech and have had a real tangible impact uh, within the organizations. Um, so with that being said, uh, unfortunately, I don't have 20 minutes to give to Casey to, to sell you all on it, but um, you know, we leave you with two calls to action. One is to initiate a self-directed carbon reduction project in your organization and to report the results to the center by the end of by the end of May next year. Um, there are resources available if you want to do this internally at your organization at carbonreductionchallenge.org. Um, and there's a number of links in the event chat uh, where you can find more information about the challenge, about the Race D. Anderson Center um, itself. Um, and then the second call to action is if you are interested in, in mentoring a CRC student team um, for next summer, summer 2021, uh, please just reach out to, to the Racy Anderson Center um, so that they can begin uh, coordinating it and, and, and discussing various ideas. Um, so once again, I wanna, I wanna thank you all for, for your time today, taking your time um, out of your busy schedules to, to come chat with us. So thank you very much. And thank you to everyone that attended. You. Thank you guys. Take care, everyone. Thank you and go jackets. Go jackets. <laughs>